In today's journey, we're going to see how we fix the dreaded stuck fermentation in our White Claw clone. This is actually such a common problem that older recipes have been updated to have yeast nutrients included. It's like mead, it's so void of nutrients and minerals that the yeast doesn't really have anything else other than what the water gives it. There was no actual nutrient schedule on the recipe, so we just added about a quarter of an ounce every two to three days. We weren't fermenting in the fermentation chamber either, so our temperature swung a lot, and when that happens, sometimes you have to re-pitch the yeast. And we did do that, but these are better solutions for when there's a bulk of fermentation still yet to happen. What's the best solution for when you just need to get those last couple of points off? Well, the first step would be to be scientific. If you're using a refractometer, double check it against some distilled water. And if you're using a hydrometer, make sure that your thermometer is getting a proper temperature reading so that your math comes out correctly. But here's how we fixed ours. Reroused in the yeast by means of transfer. This is in lieu of using the mix stir, as we will have to use that later during the clarification phase, making this the one time we recommend following the directions to solve a problem. I know, I'm scared too. But because we won't be doing anything other than a transfer, all we need to do is sanitize the carboy and the autosiphon. Yeah, I'm sure it's fine. But if you're following along with the home version, we are sticking completely within step one of the racking instructions. Check the link in the description for the full instructions. Normally we would skip something as mundane as this, but just in case this is your first time, we'll give you your brief primer on how to start a siphon transfer. No one saw that, right? Step one is to take the end with the black cap at the end of it and put it as close to the bottom of the vessel as you can. Because our main objective here is to re-rouse the yeast, we actually don't want a perfectly clear transfer. So you actually do want to see a little cloudiness this time. Normally, this would be a bad thing, but if we don't do this, we might not reactivate fermentation. The downside here is doing this transfer will also knock loose CO2 that's stuck in solution. So there's a good chance you're gonna see action in the airlock no matter what, regardless of fermentation restarted or not. One of the most common problems we see with people using the auto siphon is that they try to pump it like it's some sort of hand pump at a well or something. You wanna put it in, expand the tube, wait a moment for the center column to fill all the way, and then push firmly but gently. It should be one stroke and it's doing its goods. Sometimes you do have to give it a couple extra pumps, but don't jackhammer it, just smooth and steady. Just remember, it's more about the magic trickery of physics than it is about brute force horsepower. And speaking of physics trickery, another benefit to doing a transfer like this is it will help mix up any sweet spot pockets so that if the reading we got earlier was just from a dry spot or a sweet spot earlier, it should help even anything out. This is especially important in anything that's sat around for a long time. Like our hard seltzer here, sat here for about a month, maybe longer. So it's only natural that some of the denser, heavier sugar parts have fallen to the bottom, whereas there's more alcoholic, thinner parts towards the top. So you may have fermented completely, your equipment fine, but that your sample was either thinned out or concentrated. But remember, all of this is really going to help you get rid of those last 10 points or even less in some of these cases. For example, if you're stuck at 1020, none of these are really going to help you and there's more drastic solutions that'll need to be taken, such as re-pitching your yeast, logging your fermentation temperatures to make sure that nothing's going wonky when you're not watching, or make sure that you haven't picked up some sort of infection. And conversely, if your end goal is to keg this anyways, it doesn't really matter because it's just going to have a little residual sweetness anyways. Some people might view that as a benefit. But for people like us who have plans to bottle this, that can mess with your final equations for how much sugar you should be adding. As too much could lead to what's called a bottle bomb, which isn't explosive and dangerous, but does make a mess. Unless, of course, you use glass bottles, which you should definitely don't use glass bottles for carving this. Do re-clean and sanitize the airlock, though, because why ruin everything this so late in the game? And unless you have a film or some sort of fuzzies growing in there, it's never really too late to save it. It doesn't go bad. It may not be perfect, it may not be the best, and it might even get a bit of a sour taste to it, but hey, some people do that to beer on purpose. Once fermentation is started into a substance like this, it's really hard for it to grow something that can hurt humans. 
Although, of course, legally, you do so at your own risk. Hey, look, it's still 712. But at this point, take a hydrometer reading. If you're within spec, then move on to the clarification phase. If not, let it go sit for another couple of days, up to two weeks. Ours wasn't, so we're going to move it into the fermentation chamber, where it can ferment more reliably. Worst case scenario, we may have to pitch a little extra yeast. If that happens, you may have to do an additional transfer into what we call a tertiary phase. Otherwise, the excessive yeast cells may lead to a cloudy hard seltzer in the final product. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and don't forget to check out some of our other videos. My favorite part was when Phil got stuck in his own spiderweb of HDMI cables.